Hello, and welcome to Filling the Gaps, Bringing History Alive on Screen. I'm Ebony Adams, Manager of Public Programs for WIF. This special conversation is part of the incredible slate of programming comprising our WIF TV Summit, which is devoted to shining a spotlight on the female creatives changing our media landscape and deserving of industry recognition. We're honored to have partnered with Amazon Studios and HBO, HBO Max from this summit, and we encourage you to check out all of the conversations. We're in an incredibly vibrant and exciting time with regards to the television available to us right now, and we hope that you seek out the work and the projects you'll be hearing about. And as we head into the 2021 Emmy Award season, we want to especially encourage Academy voters to vote for women. And now I'd like to introduce you to our panelists today. Please welcome the oh. incredible and OB award-winning actress, Juliet Rylance, founder of the Theater of Memory and known for her roles on The Nick and American Gothic. She plays Della on Perry Mason. Award-winning actress Journey Smollett, known for her roles in Eve's Bayou, Underground, and as Black Canary and Birds of Prey, and who plays Letty in Lovecraft Country. Hmm. Emmy Award-winning documentary filmmaker Amy Zierin, who is known for her work on The Hunting Ground and The Invisible War, and is the co-creator, executive producer, writer, and director of Alan B. Farrow. Joy McMillan, who is nominated for an Oscar and won an Independent Spirit Award for her work on Moonlight, and is editor for The Underground Railroad, an actress, activist and Emmy nominated producer Zachary Drucker, known for her work on This Is Me and as consultant for Transparent. She's the executive producer and director of The Lady in the Dale. Moderating today's conversation is Andrea wilson Mirza, director of Reframe, a joint initiative by WIF and the Sundance Institute to mitigate bias in the screen industries. And now, Andrea, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks everyone so much for joining us. We are so excited to dig into all of your exceptional work uh, as we are ramping up to the Emmys this year. Um, all of the works that you're here representing today, I think, are just such successful examples of really using the tools of cinema, of narrative, of your own personal artistry and craft to bring history to life for contemporary audiences and a lot of untold stories as well. Um, and, the, you know, the work that all of you have done in front of and behind the camera is just what we are here to talk about. So I would love to kind of start with talking about preparation, you know, the work before the work that we are all seeing. Um, and I would love to start with Journey and, and hear a little bit about what that looked like for you when you were going into preparing for Lovecraft Country. What was preparation like for you um, to, to bring Letty to life? Oh, um, yes, it, it was quite um, intense because um, a number of reasons. The character is, you know, pretty much Letty is at the intersection of multiple identities, right? She is a woman in 1955 Jim Crow America who is Black, right? And so um, you have to understand the historical context that you are living in in order to bring a character like Letty to life. Um, so Jim Crow, right? You know, I read an extensive amount about everything from segregation in pools and sundown towns to the Green Book and how Black folks had this whole system in which, you know, in order for them to travel safely, they had to follow this Green Book and it was word of mouth that then would be printed out. And, and just the psychology behind having to live like that, right? Like just to be able to travel, and stay safe, you had to know where your markers were in order you know, to eat, to, to sleep, to use the bathroom. Um, so your auntie gets sick, right? And you need to drive from Atlanta to Chicago. Do not stop at this restaurant to pee. You know I mean? Really, really think about that and how every single day it's a, it's a, it's a struggle for your dignity, for your humanity, right? Um, it's, it's, and so for me, it was about getting very specific. Um, you know, how does a woman like Letty go throughout the world? Um, I, I also really um, went back to my own history. I, I've talked about this a lot. You know, my, my grandmother was a big influence for me in crafting Letty. Um, someone who is very much so comfortable in her own body. You know, my grandmother was a beauty queen. She was the first black Miss Gallison, Texas. Um, and despite the fact that she was so beautiful and, and had such an intelligence and such a, a wisdom beyond her time, you know, she was 
relegated to, to cleaning the homes of white folks, right? Um, in order to take care of her four children. She was a single mother in the 1950s. And so I grew up hearing these stories about how my grandmother would go to work every single day and she would press out her dress and she would put on that lipstick and do her hair and go and clean their toilets because there was no way they were going to rob her of her dignity, right? And this idea of uplifting your race and pushing the race forward was, was such a, um, such something that was on such the forefront of everyone's mind, right? Um, during this time. And so the way you spoke, you know, enunciating a certain way and being educated and, you know, you were the embodiment of, of, um, uh, of, of your choices, right? So did you choose to be up, upstanding and dignified regardless of where you were in, in, in class, quote unquote, right? Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it was, it, it's like, you know, I pulled from all sources, from photographs, from movies, from uh, Gwendolyn Brooks poetry, you know, um, I think the artists of that time, James Baldwin talks a lot about the struggle of the integrity, you know, to keep your integrity as an artist and how it's it's really your duty to um, bring light to who we are as a people, right? And so, um, yeah, I just pulled from everything I could the whole time, you know, and then Misha threw us in front of a green screen and had us, you know, drenched in blood and in, in, in the woods, you know, in mud. So it's not really the thing you can prepare for. <laughs> so it's like you do all this preparation and then you just gotta like go with it and um that's the playing side you know that's the, that's the stuff I, I just so enjoy but um yeah it, it, it is an, it's an incredible honor to to be able to have been chosen to be used to tell Letty's story because for me I feel like I walked away with way more than I could have ever given Juliet with you preparing for for 1930s Los Angeles with Perry Mason. I mean, I know it's not based on historical events per se, but the just the the mise en scene and that feeling of of what's conveyed there is so seems so so real and so authentic, so deep. What was what did your preparation look like, and how did you work with the work with the creative team? It was a really interesting um, uh, opportunity, really receiving the script um, for Perry Mason because. I feel like there are those kind of shows, like Perry Mason is one of those shows that kind of lives somewhere in the fabric of the American psyche. You know, there's, there's someone in your family has watched Perry Mason and a lot of it, you know, at some point. And, and, and so I'd actually watched Perry Mason with my dad when I was little. And it was kind of that thing that was on in England on Sunday mornings. And so I had this kind of whole memory of the show that from the first time round. So there was a, it was a strange thing of not only preparing for a period drama set in the 30s, but also taking on these sort of roles that in some way are kind of archetypal American roles. So it was sort of twofold. Um, and I really loved, um, one of the best kind of ins to Della for me was Errol, Errol Gard uh, Stanley Gardner, who wrote the original story, Perry Mason. He described Della in one of the very early stories as, secretary, quiet, fast as hell on her heels, has been places. And it was just sort of such a bizarre little description of her. And I thought, wow, like, I wanna know, like, where has she been? Like, where are the places that she's been? And I think that was kind of my first in to Della just as a character, irrelevant of period. And then you start looking at the context of the period and, and how, you know, in the original story of Perry Mason, the reason why Della Street and Perry couldn't um, uh, marry, apparently he, he proposed to her several times, was that she'd have to stop working as a secretary. She'd have to stop working if she got married. And just the, of course, I've heard my great, my great aunts when I was little talk about this and my grandmother talk about it. But the idea that she said she couldn't accept his proposal because she loved her job. And for me, that was kind of the, the end to Della, was really exploring what it meant to be a woman in that period and um, to arrive in LA and have to forge your way as a, as, a, as a working woman. 
because you're passionate about something and passionate about the law and you can only ever be a secretary and Della seems to know so much more than the men around her you know she's much faster she's always ahead of everything that's going on and yet she has no voice um and I found really that the most sort of interesting aspect about playing this very strong determined woman who's absolute passion is sort of the search for truth and justice and yet no one listens to her she's a nag um she has to kind of get really feisty with anyone for any of the men around her to take her seriously and 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 I love the fact that in this um in this series our showrunners Ron and Roland they you know they made Gala, uh, they made Della gay and that was also really fascinating because obviously at that time it would have been you know it would have been completely unacceptable. Um, so I love the fact that there's this woman who has all these sort of fabulous qualities and is kind of hidden behind a mask, um, which I, I imagine is probably true for a lot of women of that period. Um, mm. And also, you know, thinking about it, there's still many women today that it still would be completely unacceptable to come out, you know, as being gay. Um, so I, I, I always find it fascinating how stories that are set in the past inform so much of the world around us today that it's almost easier to see our contemporary world through an old lens um and i'm, I'm in london right now and i'm five minutes my, my home is five minutes from the globe theater and whenever i kind of think about all the shakespeare plays i've seen there shakespeare was doing the same thing he was setting these plays in a time just before the audience are watching them like a hundred years before sometimes and all the kind of histories and um and and it was a, a way of having the audience mirror back their own life but in a sort of safe context because it seems like a long time ago or it seems far away and i i really love that aspect about period drama how actually mm. it can really um bring home our present situation in a completely unique way feel Zachary I, I felt a bit of that in watching the lady in the dale as well like how much it is resonating you know in this this current moment and and the it is one of those incredible sort of stranger than fiction true stories that uh I think perhaps many folks weren't weren't aware of and how did you come to to Liz and and what was your discovery process like in in bringing this together uh, you know, I think as a transgender woman, it's kind of my whole life brought me to this moment mm -hmm. and to Liz. Um, trans folks are constantly trying to locate themselves in the world through mm -hmm. time and finding our history is like quicksand. It's, it has not been written. It's largely an oral history. It kind of requires networking with elders and kind of hearing directly um, the conditions of their lives. Um, you know, of course, a lot of work has been done in the past decade, especially to foreground stories of gender expansive people um, in culture and elsewhere. But Liz Carmichael was not somebody I had ever heard of. Mm -hmm. um, if you kind of read and absorbed the media from her time, you would never have even known that she was trans. She was characterized as a man masquerading as a woman to commit a crime, which is one of the oldest um, tropes of, mm -hmm. of, you know, trans people being outlawed. Um, all of the kind of masquerade and cross-dressing laws that came in the US in the 19th century were predicated on the idea that men would be masquerading as women to commit crimes. And um, Liz was no exception. Of course, the thing that's so complicated about Liz is that she was a criminal. She was a kind of petty small town um, counterfeiter, you know, check fraud. She was, you know, she was a, a, a wheeler and dealer and she had been arrested and, and evaded uh, her sentence in Los Angeles in 1961. So she'd been on the run for over a decade. During that period of time, she transitioned um, to live her life as a woman. And with 
her partner, Vivian, her wife, and their five children. And she had to eke out an existence and she went big by marketing this, you know, three-wheeled energy efficient car at the height of the oil crisis in America. And she, you know, had her kind of moment, her very short moment, taking the media by storm before, of course, being outed as a trans person and incarcerated and, um, you have to watch the show for, you know, the whole story. But it certainly is like, um, like so many of our stories, it's, it's stranger than fiction. You couldn't imagine, like you, there's no writer's room that could have come up with this right. story in any kind of plausible scenario. And yet our lives, I think in every case are unprecedented and we arrive to, a trans identity from any number of disparate positions, uh, all of the external factors are up for grabs. Like the thing that we're unified by as a community is a feeling that we have. Um, so Liz, you know, I, I think that my whole 38 years of being alive has, you know, delivered me to these figures, these, these vestiges of the past, these ghosts, these um, predecessors who lived and died and struggled and were humiliated publicly and mm -hmm. incarcerated and institutionalized and murdered and communing with them. I mean, the process of making this series was truly a kind of resurrection or, or you know, it was, an interaction with the spirit realm. I would say I would say that Liz willed this project to happen and that I am the messenger on earth, um, kind of restoring justice to her legacy. Her yeah. flawed legacy. I'm not saying that she was the main <laughs> player, <but. laughs> Joy, I wanted to hear um to hear a bit from you about kind of your your you know, early days in the process on Underground Railroad and like what, what, you know, when you were first kind of seeing dailies come in, what, what were your first impressions? What were your, those first kind of feelings of, of how you were going to get into this work and this process? It's very interesting because I was just finishing up with Jinix of Bravo, another director who mm -hmm. I've collaborated with on Zola. So to leave the world of Zola and come to the world of <laughs> the underground. Wow. wow. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That's a little amazing. bit of a switch up. <laughs> um, but it was interesting because the where chapter one takes place and where chapter 10 takes place is in the same location. So I was getting dailies from like the beginning episode and the ending episode at the same time. Uh -huh. um, which was very, I feel like informative because the last chapter, the, 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 um, the beginning of it tells the story of Mabel, who is Cora's um, mother. And Mabel really informed us how important her journey is to Cora's journey. And so while working on chapter 10, we realized, oh, you know, Mabel is such an integral part of Cora's life that we should weave her throughout the rest of the series in all the episodes. Mm. So you're, you're realizing that connection between mother and daughter, even though Cora feels abandoned by her mother, you're realizing how important it is to how it formed her um, as a character. And so those early days, I was just trying to wrap my brain around, like, how are we gonna do this series? Like, it's so massive. But um, I told my assistant editors, I was like, you know, we just gotta approach this scene by scene, day by day. We can't think of, a 10 episode series, you know, that feels a bit overwhelming, but you know, every single episode is at a time, scene by scene, developing the characters. Um, and that's pretty much how we tackle the series. I'd love to, I'd love to chat with you a little bit, Amy, um, about Alan v. Fair, or Alan versus Farrow. Um, and, you know, one of the things that critics have said about it is that it, it feels inevitable um this this piece and that you know the the social momentum around holding abusers to account and 
you know, I wonder as a producer, as you're, you know, shepherding this project and, and you know, working with the creative team, um, how do you, you know, kind of contextualize that work in the wider cultural discussions? That is a wild question. But before I know, I there, I know. because like no one has said to me it was inevitable and I, I don't <laughs> is unfathomable to me actually, mm -hmm. but it's like what Steve Jobs said is like, you don't, once, once you do it, everyone says, oh yeah, you know, but before you do it. So yeah, maybe now in retrospect, but making this thing mm -hmm. like, no, 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 no. Like everyone thought, why well, go there? We know the story. I can't even go there. But anyways, before we mm -hmm. go there, I want to just say, because I think I'm the oldest person here, how amazing it is to be on this panel with all these brilliant artists. I'm like mm -hmm. moved beyond belief. This is the first time, you know, in my history that we've had these kind of voices represented. Each one of you are doing work about hidden narratives. Mm. What a blessing, you know, like just so, so just, and then if I can also, since you encouraged us to just engage, yeah, I have a question. How did you toggle between your own personal angst, but that's not the character's angst, like what did you do at home at night? Like, did you collapse? Did you have a good therapist? I'm really actually curious. Did it not affect you? Do you have good walls? You know, it's so interesting. The The body doesn't know that you're not experiencing it, you know? Um, and I, it, it, it's, it's a process that I haven't yet to figure out how to, um, you know, I have rituals in, in like shedding the the work every night. I mean, I have a four year old son who kind of it's like you kind of have no choice but to turn into a court jester when you come home, you know. <laughs> but um, I haven't figured it out, you know. Um, when I when I wrapped um, Lovecraft Country, I cut all my hair off because I was like, I'm gonna purge myself of Letty and all these demons and because it 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 was a very ancestral project. Um, and one of my coaches, one of my teachers I work with talks about blood memory and how me being, you know, my mom's black, my dad, Jewish, Ashkenazi, Jewish man, you know, like my, my blood has memory in it, you know, like we know some oppression. Um, and so I could for sure feel it activated in moments. And it's funny cause you know, a friend of mine, is it legendary Sam Rockwell? He sent me an article about um, about uh, this amazing actor, you know, who was talking about how you know it's just you just it's just work. Like you really just gotta like think about it. I haven't figured that out, y'all. So if anyone on this panel <laughs> has the tricks, <laughs> you know, on how to like, because no, my body absolutely thinks I'm going through it, you know. Um, I just, I'm out here now in Vancouver shooting this movie with Alice and Jetty. And I'm like, you know, I came home last night. I'm like, my eyes really stink. And I realized, oh yeah, I was crying all day long in the woods and almost got hypothermia. And it's like, yeah, your body, <laughs> it's pretend, but your body doesn't know it. So I don't, yeah, that's my answer for you. Is I, I, no, I, I mean, I felt the spirits, you know, um, Zachary, when you were talking about that, I can so relate. I, I entirely felt this, my ancestors being used, I mean, using me, you know, Lovecraft is so ancestral in that way, um, as like, you know, as is Underground Railroad and, you know, all of these projects, you know, we, we as artists, I mean, it, I don't know. I think it's our job though, also to, to, it's our instrument, you know, I mean, it's what we do. We, we illuminate humanity, right? Um, so yeah, that, I don't know if that answers your question, <laughs> oh, but I would love to hear your answer <laughs> to well, the question that you were asked because I'm so fascinated by how, I mean, how'd you work with the family and like, mm -hmm. you know, it, the, the sensitivity around the topic and like oh. re-triggering them. That's, that's all I could think about. They're just going to go through it again, you know, and go through the trauma again as everyone's talking about it. And It was really, really hard and it wasn't, um, I think in your question, you said uh, it seems overdetermined or something like, of course, people would go back and look and excavate this story. But actually, it was pretty much the contrary. As I said, whenever we pitched it, people were like, been there, done that. No one's interested. 
And what we found actually was that there is, we all thought we knew a story, but no one knew it at all. It was just a PR spin and a really, you know, a really cannily crafted one that had us all hoodwinked for decades. And so that was kind of why we were motivated. And it was also, we were motivated to make this mostly because I'd made two, we, we, our team had made a few films in the sexual assault space. And every time we screened our films, someone would come up and say, please do something on incest. Talk about hidden stories. It's the third rail. Like we can't speak. If we speak, they know it's apparent. If we don't have proof, it's libel. So I didn't even know that or realize that. So we're completely silenced. So I had sort of always in the back of my mind really wanted to, to talk about, you know, interest, intrafamilial assault. And then I inadvertently was doing a different project and interviewed Dylan for that project. We thought it was just going to be a series on women that spoke out post me too. And she said so much in that interview that I was like, wait, what? Like, I didn't know that. Wait, how did I never hear that? That we started digging in and doing it. And that's kind of how Alan B. Farrow came about. But it was really, as you, as you said, Journey as well, it was like, it was not easy at all. I mean, it was, as you can see, I mean, the whole series is about this family's personal story and then their re-victimization by their trial in public, which was, you know, highly defamatory and highly erroneous, but scarred all of them for life, you know, like a grenade. And so we kind of had to look at that story and, and, and try and do right by it, as, as all of you have said in, in the stories you're crafting and sort of go, wait, what really happened and how can we learn from this? And, and in what ways does this narrative still infect what happens in the courts today when children, when children are, are in the family courts? That's the one thing I will say, which if you haven't watched the series, I want people to know is that the legacy of the Woody Allen case is that he wrote the playbook for that reverse strategy. When you're the best defense is a good offense. So if you're attacked, you immediately claim you're the victim. We've seen that played out several times over the last four years. Um, and uh, so he did that and he did that, you know, so well that actually it was used, it's been used ever since by fathers and more often than not sends children back to their abusers. Yeah, that was such a powerful takeaway. I just have to say, I mean, one of the things though that just, it, it, it's, it's so difficult to watch, but it's also so important and necessary to watch. But one of the things that just beyond like the actual crime and the sickening I just couldn't believe how the media just bought this narrative. I mean, can you speak to that? Like, not that you can explain it, but it's just like, the fuck? So it's really instructive for all of us, you know, when you talk about racism, misogyny, sort of just how these narratives stick and they, and they really cause so much unnecessary harm and they're so violent and they're so wrong. But yeah, I mean, there's no, you know, there's, there's just, I mean, those, those lives were all shattered by, you know, our love for a lovable, you know, a, a, a lovable white guy, you know, who presented himself as hapless and, you know, um, beloved, you know, and that kind of, that's very strong. That's a very strong thing in our culture. You know, we've been raised and in, 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 inculcated throughout our history to sort of that's who we revere and that's those are the people that we think you know their their power shouldn't be challenged Zachary I was I was that just made me think of your your work too and I I, th I think that the interview um footage with Susan Stryker is so fantastic in this in in your piece like in 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 kind of setting up as you said this this narrative of like a complicated human like she's she's a trans woman and she's a criminal and all of these things are true um and i mean in in thinking of the contemporary context of when this work is airing and and the the wider kind of conversation and and some some very scary legislation happening right now as well um like how how are you feeling in that conversation how how have you seen the the film have impact you know, I think to, to Amy's point about how deeply rooted the structures of misogyny and patriarchy are, I mean, it's the microcosm of Liz's story as well, as somebody who is subverting the gender binary and, you know, creating her own path. It was such a direct threat to Dick Carlson, 
the father of Tucker Carlson, which of course is <laughs> kind of in the last episode of the series, but ultimately the story of Dick Carlson and Liz Carmichael is a microcosm of, of national conversation today, mm. um, centering around, you know, trans children's rights to participate in sports and to have access to gender affirming health care. Um, it's a culture war that's been happening since the industrial era, at least. <laughs> um, and I think that it's rooted in a hatred of women, um, mm -hmm. of trans women, you know, how dare you, mm -hmm. you know, ex expunge your responsibility to like upholding the patriarchy for, mm -hmm. um, you know, to be the, of the lesser sex. Um, Susan Stryker, I think, is a, is a luminary for sure. I mean, in any documentary, you rely on, you know, intelligent people <laughs> to kind of break it down for you. And I think she just does that so eloquently to really talk about how sexism is connected to transphobia or how they're one and the same, ultimately, that, you know, gender is... Um, policed um, by men and anybody who steps outside of the, you know, circumscribed roles of their assigned gender at birth, um, be pilloried and punished. Um, it's more prescient today than, than ever. And truthfully, this story, which takes place primarily in 1974, is just a very humble beginning point for something that has gotten both better and worse. I, I think the future is better and worse simultaneously, that progress moves alongside opposition. And we are, you know, we, we have an ethical responsibility to be on the side of justice, um, mm -hmm. knowing full well that there's lots of people on the other side trying to make it impossible for us to live. I Well, I'm excited too about the, you know, exploring historical narratives and the truth of that, like, you know, we have always been here, like, you know, um, and and I think that that carries through so many of the, the works that we're seeing and talking about today. Journey, one of the things that I love about Lovecraft Country is like the core cast, I mean, is amazing, obviously, but there, I, I love a road trip concept you know it's like we're just we're on the journey right like we as an audience are on the journey and y'all are on the journey together and and I'm curious about like in working through this like incredibly challenging history not even mentioning the science fiction complications of of shooting and working but how did you what was that community like with each other how did you how did you all process that together Oh, I mean, it was incredibly beautiful. I mean, I, I was it. I was spoiled, honestly, to be able to um, work with such a, a tribe of beautiful artists like um, Jonathan Majors and Courtney B. Vance and Michael K. Williams and Wumi and Anjanu and Abby. I mean, it, it's it's very challenging work, but when you have a tribe of folks who are all in it together, it it really propels you forward and fuels you in a way because one, we were all there with the same goal in mind and that's just to do justice to the text, right? Um, and we had, we, Courtney B. Vance in the pilot started this ritual in which he would give me and Jonathan a fist bump before each take. Now a fist bump, I don't know if it, period accurate. I doubt it is. I don't know these things. <laughs> but he would give me and Jonathan this fist bump, which pretty much meant like, I got you and I know you got me. And honestly, shooting the pilot, it was like a shit show. I mean, we were just like, okay, where are we? You know, it, it, there was a, it was very challenging. But there was something in this fist bump. It's so simple and it's so hard to describe to people. But it was a ritual that Jonathan and I kept. We continued once, you know, once we went into the show. And it it grew in it grew from that to like prayer every morning. I mean, it was 
it was truly, truly um, a beautiful experience to have this group of artists who, look, we were pushing each other. That's the other thing. It's like, it's, it's not like we were in scene just be like, okay, I'm gonna, no, it was like, all right, we got, I mean, you come take one, you better be ready. You be, you don't know your lines? Get, what the hell? You know, it's so, it, it wasn't even that at all. Like they were, everyone was on their A game. And so, yeah, I was, I, I was very spoiled in that sense, but also don't really know I would have survived shooting Lovecraft Country without them. I mean, there, there are legit moments in which, this is what Courtney would tell me, he was like, He's like, you just throw your body. I'd be like, I was in the hospital like three different times on this shoot, you know, because I for some, I got burned, got stabbed. I'd be like, I, I don't know why. With this one in particular, I injured myself a lot. But having them, you know, to kind of keep you grounded and, and stuff. Yeah, we were a team. That's all I can say is is we were we were a team and and on, the fortunate thing is, is we didn't have like that infighting or any of that type of stuff. It, it was just such a beautiful process. And I'm incredibly grateful to them and to Misha and the whole crew who hired this tribe. You know, I mean, you never really know. I mean, you all know who are actors, actresses, you know, um, that this is, is kind of a crapshoot. I mean, you sign on to do these things with these people and you become a family. But with being a family, you could like hate your family. You don't choose your family, you know. <laughs> luckily, <laughs> luckily we we were a family. We all it was nothing but love. I love that. It was the best ones. Yeah. <laughs> well, on it, like in that theme of collaboration, um, Joy, I I would love to just hear a little bit about. Like, I love what you shared already about you know just how almost, you know, the, the way that you came into the project and, and what y'all were looking at and how those storylines strung together. But how do, how do you work with your collaborators? What is that, what is that team like for you, especially in, in a project like this told over, you know, so many hours? What does that look like for you? You know, it's um, Barry Jenkins, the director, and James Laxon, the cinematographer, and Mark Syriac, um, one of the producers and also Adela Romanski, one of the producers, we all went to film school together. So we've been doing this uh, quite some time. <laughs> and so um, I think the collaboration process has probably um, just become even more trusting over the years. Um, Cause I remember back in film school, we had a night shoot. So I was like getting ready to leave at like, you know, 9 PM and it was until like 6 AM. And I remember my roommates were like, why are you going to do this? Like, is there going to be a teacher there, you know, um, taking role? I'm like, no, we're filmmakers. And so that was kind of like the bond that began back in film school was like, you show up for one another. So when it's time to do your project, people show up to your set. And so I think that really speaks to our current collaboration process where we're always showing up for each other. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I from production, I got this amazingly beautiful footage. And so now I have that responsibility to honor this footage and do it justice. And also, you know, the, the, you know, the nucleus or the, the catalyst of all of this comes from, you know, this amazing novel by Colson Whitehead. Um, and I think that was one of the things that Barry and I, you know, we were very stressful about, like, we have to do Colson justice. And, you know, once we heard back that he loved the series, it was just like, well, now everything else is just icing on the cake, you know, because to take someone's baby and, you know, present it to the world in a you know particular way, you want them to be proud of it. And so, um, yeah, the collaboration process, one of the things that we really wanted to focus on was being sure that Cora didn't get lost in the shuffle. And, you know, like listening to everyone talk about, you know, um, making these amazing shows, I kind of feel so proud of the fact that our voices are now included in the narrative. You know, so much of this, you know, people say like history is told by the victors and so many of those victors are men. And so for us females to be getting in there and being a part of the, you know, the voices that are now telling these stories, I, you know, I just feel so honored to be a part of this panel. I, couldn't think of a better note to kind of sum all of this up. I have to say personally, I'm so 
in love with having documentary creatives and narrative creatives in the same space. It's such a beautiful thing that we don't often get to do. Um, and I hope it's been it's been restorative for you all as well to get to to connect even briefly and chat about each other's work. Uh, thank you so, so much uh, for joining us, for joining Women in Film at the TV Summit. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, Women in Film. Thank you, everyone. It's really an honor.